Okay, I have with me today Colonel Douglas McGregor. We're going to be talking about the Russia-Ukraine war. We're going to talk about what the White House is doing to try to pigeonhole the next president into the war that Biden wants against Vladimir Putin. Colonel McGregor, thank you so much for coming on today. Sure. So uh, you, you probably saw this uh, reports in the news that the White House is looking for ways to make it extremely difficult to get out of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, how does the Biden administration plan to make it difficult for a future president to exit long-term military support deals with Ukraine um, as we're reading in the, the Wall Street Journal? Well, I think this is a really important topic because it, it actually is in a more, in a broader sense about how do we end this catastrophe? Uh, and what effectively, it's not just President Biden, by the way, this is a, a bipartisan effort by what I call the uniparty, because he's got support from Republicans and Democrats in great numbers to keep this destructive and pointless proxy war against Russia going as long as possible. Now, he's ultimately interested, or at least his uh, supporters are, or his managers or handlers, whatever you want to call it, to keep this thing going in perpetuity. I mean, this is a cash cow, sadly, for a lot of the wrong people in Washington. A friend of mine pointed out to me the other day, he said, Doug, have you taken a ride around Washington, D.C., drive through Potomac, Maryland, and then over to uh, Great Falls and McLean and so forth and see the enormous estates, mansions, whatever you want to call them, that have sprung up in these areas, largely as a consequence of this uh, unending series of interventions and wars. These are people that have uh, operated within the broader framework of the military industrial congressional complex, and they've stuffed huge quantities of cash into their pockets. Ukraine promises to keep a lot of that going, although just as a, an aside, in case for some reason the cash cow called Ukraine stops producing, we've always got China and uh, the imminent threat to Taiwan, which of course is nonsense. So the, these things are all part and parcel of the same thing. How do we sustain this uh, $28 billion here, $30 billion there, that pays people very, very well inside the Department of Defense and the Pentagon and the defense industries and so forth, that justifies lots of pointless headquarters and four stars and so on. Uh, first of all, it doesn't matter what he does because you can undo executive arrangements overnight. You know, this is not a, a treaty that was approved by the Senate that then becomes law. So whatever whatever he thinks he's doing when he signs something as an executive agreement, those things can be overturned in 24 hours with a new president. So I, I don't see that as as ominous as others would see it. I think it gets to this issue of Washington doesn't want to end this conflict, which is very foolish and very dangerous. So then the next question is, how does it end? Well, I think it ends in three ways. First of all, the Russians, who have been very deliberate and very cautious about moving forward against the Ukrainians uh, in the hopes that someone with uh, common sense would come forward and negotiate an end to this, finally conclude, well, that's hopeless. They press all the way to the Dnieper River. They, they press right into Kiev, and they cross the river in the south and take Odessa because they see no alternative. And even then, if there's no willingness to come to some sort of arrangement, well, then they call up another four or 500,000 troops and they go all the way to the Polish and Romanian borders. So th that's one way this could end. The second way that it ends is a financial economic crisis. We have a lot, it's interesting to watch the news this morning and the usual suspects on the various cable news networks are saying, oh, what a great week in the stock market. Well, I'm sure it was a very good week, but what they don't bother telling anybody is that we are as close to the kind of 29 disaster as we have ever been in our history. And all of a sudden, all these great gains in the so-called stock market be wiped out in the space of a few minutes. Now, why? <clears throat> Everyone will come forward with a different theory, but the, the bond yields are up. The prices are down. And at some point, massive numbers of banks, both inside the United States and around the world, are going to look at all these treasury bonds that they invested in 
20 years ago when the interest rates were very, very low and discover that, gosh, they're worthless. How do I get rid of these damn things? And when that happens, uh, you're going to have a fire sale like nobody's ever seen, and that will produce a an implosion in the financial system. Now, some people will step forward and say, well, look, this happened to the British not long ago, I guess in the spring and March. And uh, the, the Bank of England said, no, 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 we'll buy up whatever is necessary. And they managed to get past the crisis. Well, the same conditions that applied to Great Britain a few months ago still apply there and they apply here. And you're not going to be able to get past it. And we cannot simply buy up all these bonds. It's, it's just not possible. Now, you add to this the toxic debt that is already on the Fed's uh, spreadsheets and balance, and then go even further. Look at the banks around the country. The Silicon Valley Bank was just the beginning. We've had more banks fail. We continue to hear that more banks are failing. At some point, all of it fails. Now, then you ask someone like Nassim Taleb, this is the gentleman that invented the concept of the black swan. When does it all happen? And he'll look at you and he said, well, Armageddon is in view. But I can't tell you when it's going to happen. Yeah. I can't either. But it's very definitely there. And the, you have also these other exogenous forces, things beyond the United States, like the Ukraine war. What happens in Ukraine doesn't seem to matter very much to most Americans. But let me tell you something. If the Russians press ahead and crush everything and then start moving west, that will have a big impact in Europe. And that impact will be felt here. And the Europeans are ultimately more fragile in the economic and financial sense, as you know, than we are. Germany and France really are the most important states in Europe. Germany is already in a deep recession. And there's no easy way out of it. They, they've been on a path of national suicide now from the moment they decided to join this anti-Russian proxy war. I don't see an easy way for them to get out. France is obvious. France is a seething, boiling pot of anger and hostility because millions of non-Europeans have flooded into that country and threatened the very existence of France, not just French national identity, French history and culture, but France, the nation state itself. The, the rest of Europe is watching. And you know what they always say about uh, Paris. Uh, when Paris uh, coughs, the rest of Europe gets a cold. And I think you're going to see something very much like that occur. So to briefly sum up, <clears throat> that's another way the war ends. Everybody just goes broke overnight, cuts their losses, and gets out. And the Europeans are already pulling back. We are not because, frankly, $28 billion is decimal dust to us. When you have a $34 trillion debt and you're almost up to 120% debt to GDP ratio, what difference does uh, another $28 billion make? And that's where we are. Uh, so that's one way. And then there's a, there's another way. And uh, this is one that everybody wants, but no one can find evidence for it. And that is that if someone steps forward, either leading Europe or even here in the United States and says, we want an off ramp, we want to end this. Well, I don't see that happening in Washington. So the only other way this happens is if the Europeans break away from us. And of course, that would mean fundamentally the end of NATO. You've already got the EU on life support. Everybody hates the EU. You can find different reasons in every country. The Germans don't like it because they're tired of being the cash cow for Europe. But everybody else in Europe likes to blame the Germans for all of their problems. So this is a, it's a bizarre set of circumstances, but everybody's fed up with the EU. And this is why no one in Washington and certainly none of the current governments in Europe are willing to step forward and make peace because to do so is an existential threat to them. They're, they are at war with the Russian state and the Russian people. The rest of us are not. They're at war because they've decided that Russia, this last nation state left in Europe that won't open its borders to millions of non-Europeans and, and non-Christians, they do have 20, 25% Muslims, but those Muslims are overwhelmingly very content to live in Russia. And by the way, that's not new. In 1915, the Turks thought they were going to launch an Islamist crusade and liberate all the Muslims from Tsarist Russia. They crossed the Caucasus and found no one was interested in being liberated because the people were quite content to live under the Tsar. We have a similar situation today in Moscow. But the point is that Russia is not going to knuckle under. 
It's not going to bow down to our financial hegemony. It's not going to tolerate our military hegemony. It's not going to accommodate our political dominance. So the only way this ends in the third sense is for the Europeans to step forward and say enough's enough. And of course, that's something we don't want. But frankly, I think we're doing everything in our power to make that happen. Yeah. Um, a, a mutual friend uh, between us, uh, Max Blumenthal of the Gray Zone, he had mentioned in an interview with me that uh, as he drives around Washington, D.C., it's just these man McMansions going up everywhere. And as you dig in and research, they're almost all connected to the military industrial complex. So he says, on the one hand, they're flying the Ukrainian flag. On the <laughs> other hand, if yeah. that war stops, they can't pay their mortgage. You know, so like they they have in, more incentive to keep this thing going. The other thing uh, that uh, stood out to me in the last week was I had Ray McGovern on and he said, um, whether it's true or not, Russia has to be America's boogeyman or you can't justify an $800 billion military budget. What What are your thoughts on uh, Mr. McGovern's uh, comment? Well, you know, Ray's a great person and he makes great points, <clears throat> but he's wrong. Okay. Uh, eliminate Russia from the equation and you have China. Okay, well, they just get a new boogeyman. Yeah, I mean, that, that's it. And, you know, I, all the time people say, oh, you just don't understand China. And I always say, how many times have you been to Northeast Asia? How many people do you know in the region? What's your knowledge of Chinese history, culture, and civilization? The, the, the Chinese are probably the oldest continuous uh, civilization on the planet. Uh, where is the evidence for all of the uh, sinister motives and designs that you're imputing to them? Uh, I don't see it. If you look carefully at China today, it's pretty much where it was in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. It, it's expanded to the limits of its capabilities. It can't expand any further. They've got 1.4 billion people. Every morning, Xi does not wake up and think of ways to attack America. Xi wakes up every morning thinking of ways to hold China together. Uh, I, I don't think people understand that. And they want to blame the Chinese for fentanyl. Well, the Chinese are making it and selling it. And in many cases, it's Chinese organized crime. And in a nation of 1.4 billion that has a long, long history of uh, criminality and what I would call black market operations, it's pretty tough to crack down on all of that and hold it together. But in, in the case of China right now, the stuff is coming into the United States via the drug cartels that operate out of Mexico and the Caribbean Basin. Those are your problem, not China. Hey there, it's Steven Gardner. I'm so sorry to interrupt this important interview, but if you have a mortgage, I wanna tell you there's a better way to pay that house off in seven years or less. You need to meet with one of my coaches over at Replace Your Mortgage, where they will show you how to pay that house off in seven years or less using the same income you have right now. We all know that for most people, buying a house is their biggest investment, yet banking products are systematically designed to make banks wealthy. I wanna help you be wealthy and get debt free even faster. So I'll leave a link down below for that. Go check it out. Okay, let's get back to this interview. So you shut down the border, secure the border, and restore the rule of law inside the United States. Stop this nonsense of releasing criminals and slapping people on the hands who probably should be executed, frankly, and instead install a government that protects the people. Remember, government has to do three things. It has to protect the population, has to shelter the population, has to feed the population. Xi is doing that. Putin is doing that. Our government is not doing that. It's not protecting us in the least. All you have to do is open the newspapers, watch cable television, you'll get a fraction of what's actually happening. But the criminality in our country is, is epidemic. I mean, you go to a gas station in Philadelphia, you're lucky you're not being shot on the spot. You know, you try to shop, you can't, the place is being looted. All the major stores are leaving. Look at San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia. It's, it's terrible. But no one wants you to look at that. It's almost though, don't pay any attention to that. Look at the threat from Russia. Look at the threat from China. But the truth is, Ukraine is of no strategic vital interest to us, never has been. 
And the regime sitting in Kiev is hardly the, the paragon of liberal democracy. It's the opposite. It's, it's worse than that. It's almost Stalinist at this point. It is an organized crime state. It was when the war began. So this, this is all nonsense. But, you know, Max is correct. Uh, people are profiting enormously from it, and they don't think it harms them. But then there's this other possibility, and that is that we're dumb. We do stupid things. We try to intervene in Western Ukraine at the last minute to try and rescue our credibility, which is already in the gutter anyway with most of the world. And we bring on a major war with the Russians. What we don't understand right now is that we have threatened and bullied the Chinese for years to the point where the Chinese have convinced themselves they've got to prepare to defend themselves against us and our attacks. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to join with the Russians. So now you're in a, in a war that involves not simply the Russian state and its armed forces, which are, by the way, better and more capable than China's, but nevertheless, you know, you've got Chinese scientific industrial power and manpower linked to Russia. And what about the rest of the world? All you have to do is look at BRICS. Look at the recent acquisitions of BRICS. You know, Saudi Arabia, whose uh, importance to us cannot be overstated when it comes to the petrodollar. Saudi Arabia has just announced, well, I'm, I, we're joining BRICS. They plan to join this new gold-backed currency. What's happening to our financial hegemony? It's being eroded away as we sit here and talk. The world is going to de-dollarize. It's not going to happen overnight. It won't happen in six months. It'll happen in a year, in two years, in three years. But the handwriting's on the wall. Why? Everyone is sick of us. So Max is right, but it's even worse than Max suggests. We've created this whole ruling political class that is entirely dependent on governmental largesse. It's in their interest to do these things. And that's why when I've talked to people, I said, how do you explain the open borders? I mean, wh wh what the hell is going on? Why would we do such a thing? Why would we invite millions of people into this country from all sorts of places? It's no longer just Latin America. We have a third of the Mexican population or more living in the country anyway. But you go beyond that now. You're picking up people from Africa, the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, Asia. Why? 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 Well, it tends to create the illusion or at least the possibility that you and I and other Americans like us can never win another election. That our population is so diluted by all of these non-Americans that have been welcomed into our country that we have no chance of ever governing ourselves again. We will be governed by this political class who's resting comfortably on the foundation of all these foreigners. This is a very dangerous thing that bodes ill for the future of the United States, because at some point, when things get rough and people can't eat, Americans are not different from Frenchmen or Germans or anyone else. They start to look around and say, oh, wait a minute, why can't I find something to eat? Because this man over here is not even an American. He's competing for the same thing I am. Why is he here? Why does he enjoy rights? This is why I brought up the fact that all of these uh, so-called migrants, illegals, whatever you want to call them, asylum seekers, which is a lot of nonsense, who are being allowed into the country are handed $2,200 a month. Then they're told, here's a ticket to wherever you want to go in the United States. We'll send you there. But we won't pay or cannot pay the average American worker who works all of his life and pays into Social Security more than about $1,400 a month. What's wrong with this picture? This is insane. So this ruling class in Washington needs to go away. The problem is that how do you get rid of them? How do you dispose of them? How do you drive them out of power? That's what has to happen. We've got to do that. And Americans have to wake up and understand this two-party business is an illusion. They're all in it together. I mean, for everybody like uh, Chip Roy or Andy Biggs, there are 10 or 20 others in the uh, House that are part of the problem. You know, for every Rand Paul or Mike Lee, there are another 10 or 20 senators who are part of the problem. And they don't understand why Mike Lee and Rand Paul and Chip Roy and Andy Biggs aren't standing in line with their hands out to cash in. They don't get it. So th this is a, an insoluble problem at the, at the moment, but it will be solved because 
other things that we can't predict. This Armageddon that Nassim Taleb talks about in the financial sector. The fact that, you know, we say we're doing really well economically. Well, then what are all these tent cities filled with homeless for? You know, what's happening there? What what about salaries and, and uh, wages? What about housing? You know, I, I listened to RFK Jr. mention that, you know, we're reaching a point where the average American can't afford a home. I mean, the interest rates are going up and up and up, and they can't possibly come up with the cash. But there's a savior in the background called the bankers. They have lots of cash. They're buying up the homes. And pretty soon, I think they expect that all of us will become happy serfs on their plantations and uh, we'll live in houses they own and we pay them to live there. I mean, this is this is bad news. This can't go on. This is un-American. All of these things are going to contribute to the end of this catastrophe in Ukraine. And when it ends, it's going to end for all of these reasons, not just what's happening over on the ground, because clearly the war is over. People are now finally saying, you know, McGregor, you were right. You told the truth. 400,000 dead Ukrainians. Ukrainians themselves had accidentally admitted to that when they were saying that we have to celebrate the great contributions of all these patriotic heroes and mentioned 400,000 dead. Now, that's more dead than we sustained during three years of fighting in World War II. Think about it. And most of our losses were against the Germans, an army that had no tactical air cover and was already torn between multiple fronts trying to keep the Soviet military machine from destroying what was left of Western civilization. So who are we kidding? This, this, is, this is not going to last. This can't go on. Everything will change. But it's not going to change because someone orchestrates it and stands up and says, stop. I mean, I wish someone would tell the truth and say, well, you know, we need to restructure our debt. Oh, no, no, no. That's defaulting. Well, it's also called restructuring. FDR did it twice while he was president. We need to do it. We can't go on because the interest rates are no longer truly under Jerome Powell's control. You know, he, he made some ridiculous statement uh, from Wyoming saying, well, there's always uncertainty when you're trying to predict events and it's a cloudy day overhead. Huh? You're the Fed chairman? And this is what you're telling us? A weather report. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this whole, this whole thing is a facade. It's all going to fall apart. But we just don't know exactly when. And until then, you're going to be told by your government, oh, don't worry. Be happy. Go shop. Spend money. Well, yeah. You know, I think there was a statement from uh, one of my favorite uh, movies. What was it called? Dodgeball. <laughs> Old strategy, Cotton. Let's see how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's where we're headed. Okay. Uh, how might uh, somebody like Donald Trump or Robert F. Kennedy Jr. approach ending the war and approach communicating with Putin uh, compared to like Joe Biden, who... He, he would rather be on vacation than try to communicate with a, another global leader. What, what can you imagine what their approach might be to ending this war? Sure. The first thing that either of them has to do without even calling Moscow or anyone else is call Kiev and simply say, gentlemen, if you want to use that term to describe them, I would not. We are suspending aid to you immediately. And we are withdrawing all U.S. military personnel and support personnel and contractors in and out of uniform immediately. Now, once you do those two things, the Russians will talk to you. Okay. Then you can say, I'm calling Moscow. And you can ask, you say, look, these are the decisions I made. Uh, let's wait for two weeks and you will see what we have essentially ordered actually happens because the Russians aren't going to take it seriously until they see real action. Th those are not just signals. Those are dramatic actions that say, we want to end this conflict. Then the Russians will talk to you. And when you go in to talk to the Russians, you have to take a seat, uh, drink some coffee or tea and whatever they decide to give you. And then 
listen to the Russians. All of this has happened because we refuse to listen to anyone in Moscow for decades. This, of course, was George Kennan's argument. Listen to the Russians. You may not always understand them, but if you listen carefully, they will explain their position and why. Now, you can accept it or you can leave it. But at that point, I think there's a chance to negotiate an end to this terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy. But we can't go in there and stipulate conditions. We can't make demands because this war's over. It's been lost. Now, will we go in and try to rescue this thing with military power? I think that would be a huge disaster for us. I don't see anything good coming for it, and I don't see anything good in Europe happening. Yeah, that, that's my worry is, as you mentioned earlier, we, we try to go in and rescue Western Ukraine uh, and get ourselves pulled into something that we don't want to be a part of versus telling Western Ukraine, uh, we're done. Uh, you guys can continue to fight this on your own, but we want this other nuclear superpower to see that we are retreating, we're creating space, and then we're going to come in with our, our hands shown no weapons, and we're going to have a discussion and, and end this war. I don't think Biden wants to do that. He shows zero signals. But meanwhile, Donald Trump and RFK Jr., they're saying things like, that's exactly what I would do first, right? RFK Jr. said, I, I would immediately try to get Putin on the phone. Everyone I've ever had to sue in court has been an enemy, but we've always been able to communicate. We've always been able to see each other's side while we work through a problem. Uh, and and that, that seems to be the kind of leadership that that Americans are looking for, and yet we're we're stuck with this guy who just, you know, can't can't find his way off a stage. Almost, it's it's embarrassing at this point. Well, I don't think he's uh, <clears throat> in charge of much of anything. I think there are powerful forces behind him on the left. Uh, I sometimes refer to them as leftist oligarchs. I've had people tell me that from the very beginning, George Soros has been effectively the shadow national security advisor. So this is the worst possible poison to pour into anyone's ear inside the White House. But I wouldn't use the word retreat. Uh, if you do that, everyone has a heart attack. Oh, we've lost. Well, I've got news for you. We lost Vietnam. Uh, we lost there because it was a very dumb idea. We were six, seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 miles from home. We were fighting in a war we didn't even understand. We're doing the same thing now. This is six, seven, eight thousand miles away. We don't understand what's really at, at the heart of this, never did, don't care. Uh, our interest was this, this sort of absurd goal of remove Putin from office, destroy the Russian state, then strip it of its resources and make it part of our utopian Western world, thanks to globalism. No thanks, it's not gonna happen. It hasn't worked in Western Europe, it's not working very well here. So you can you can get on the phone and call them. They're not going to pay any attention to what you say. They're going to look at what you do. And that's why I say the first thing you've got to do, suspend the aid. Pull out all of your uniformed or civilian contractors, military advisors, you name it. Get them out. Then I think the Russians would be happy to sit down and talk. But you've got to listen to what they say. It's not a question of RFK Jr., or Donald Trump walking in with the solution. Uh, they can try, but it's you really got to let the Russians state their position and, and what their minimal requirements are, because you're probably going to have to accept them unless you want to declare war and broaden this tragedy unnecessarily. Yeah. Okay, two more questions, then I'll let you go. I appreciate your time. Um, th these last two are a tiny bit political, so I, I, I'll try to keep it military, uh, but um, we, we have a, a sitting president who, while vice president, had multiple fake emails. Uh, front page of the Daily News yesterday was that they found 5,400 emails between him and his son Hunter and other foreign leaders. Uh, now, today, they found a thousand emails between uh, President or Vice President Biden's email address and Hunter Biden's law firm asking for favors, needs, upcoming events. Why, why on earth would a vice president need 
to operate incognito using fake names and emails. It, it, it does not make any sense. Well, he needs to do it because his actions are illegal. That's the easy answer to the question. <clears throat> He's aggrandizing himself and his family through governmental influence and instrumentalities. Uh, that's fundamentally illegal, unacceptable. But remember that Washington is this stagnant swamp of corruption. I mean, for anybody to stand up, with the exception of people like Rand Paul or Mike Lee or, as I said, Chip Roy or Andy Biggs, and say this is a disgrace would be a joke because these people are hypocrites. You know, ever hear of something called insider trading? How do people show up worth you know, a couple of hundred thousand or maybe a million dollars and walk out years later with 10, 15, 20 million? Well, gosh, by, by insider trading. People come and give them tips or they call up and say, hey, what do you think? You know, Oscar, Otto, Max, what, what should I, where should I put my money? Well, if you don't do this, you're going to make a lot of money. Okay. And then somebody says, well, are you engaged? Absolutely not. I would never do that. So you, it's a big case of the pot calling the kettle black. We don't know how many people on the Hill are also involved with Biden. Uh, we, it, it's probably a snake pit uh, with lots of snakes wriggling around in it. Uh, th this is the problem with the system. At some point, every governmental structure breaks down. At some point, the system fails. We're at failure. The Americans haven't noticed because the checks continue to arrive. As long as the checks are cut and the food stamps are provided, everybody says, oh, well, I guess everything must be okay. No, it's not okay. You know, we think we've recovered from the problems we had with the uh, you know, food chains and distribution chains, supply chains, forget it. They're still out there. And our position overseas is more vulnerable than it's ever been. You look at the energy sector, this administration has done just about everything it possibly could to destroy it. And this is the problem for an RFK Jr. or Donald J. Trump. They get in. They win. So it's going to take a decade to recover from the damage we've done to ourselves. Now, admittedly, a lot of this damage has accumulated over 30 years. I could take you back to the Clinton era and show you where the damage really took off. For that matter, we can go back to the Reagan years where the uh, suddenly uh, exporting jobs and manufacturing overseas really got started. It was Reagan who declared amnesty on the assumption, well, we'll do this one-time amnesty and then everything will get better. Well, the one-time amnesty was an invitation to millions more to come to the United States. So this this has th th these are old problems. The, what's happened over the last two and a half years is the cancer has metastasized. You've gone from something that could uh, could be uh, eliminated or treated effectively to this massive cancer that's infecting the entire body politic, our economy, and the financial system. Everything is sick. How do you cure it? Well, you cure it quickly if you're willing to adopt very harsh measures. No one right now will accept harsh measures, but people do accept harsh measures when their lives tank, when they're miserable, when they, they don't have enough to eat, they can't care for their families. That's when things change. We're a, we're a little away from that, but I would not say we're far from it. And again, I urge people travel around the country. Look at the food banks. How do we keep these food banks full? The food banks are vital and essential. I live 65 miles west of uh, Washington, D.C. The food banks out here are emptied routinely. We all put food in, and there's so many people that need it, they show up. That's not that far from the nation's capital. What's it like 600 miles from here? It's a lot worse. You know, the Washington bubble is, is a menace. If you live in it, you think, oh, everything's fine. I'm fine. People are fine. Look how happy they are. Right. It's it's not the case. Yeah. I remember a billionaire Peter Thiel said one time, he <laughs> said, they keep you distracted on your phone so you don't realize the roads and the subways haven't been fixed in 50 years. Um, you know, it's like, okay. We can't do these hardware updates, but we'll just keep you distracted with software updates. Well, well you're, you're, you've got the ruins of empire. Yeah. 
here and in Great Britain. I mean, when I first started going over to Great Britain, I was astonished at the shoddy infrastructure, the rail lines and so forth. Uh, you know, I grew up in North Philadelphia and I routinely rode on the Pennsylvania and Reading Railroads. And then ultimately I ended up on this Metro Rail nonsense. All of that is antiquated. You know, you pick up your cell phone, you're still reliant on towers everywhere. In China, it's satellite based. In Japan and Korea, it's satellite based. Why are we behind this? When Obama launched this infrastructure bill, one of the first things that came up in all the discussions in government and in the military was, we need to bury the power lines. There shouldn't be any power lines visible above ground. It's an essential national security thing. And while we're at it, we've got to fix the electrical grid. What did we do? Nothing. Where'd the money go? The campaign supporters? Donors? I mean, this, this, is, this is out of control. It's got to stop. The Romans had a term for this kind of situation. It was called state of exception. And during a state of exception, they would appoint initially two consuls, later on just one. And everyone would agree that for the sake of the Roman state and its survival, everyone would now do what the leader said. In other words, the normal business approaches, the normal laws were all suspended because things were so bad that if we did not adopt emergency measures, the Roman state would fail. I think we're already in the state of exception. So when do we declare it? And where? how do we rescue ourselves from this terrible situation? That's why, you know, I, I think the world of Donald Trump, I think very highly of RFK Jr. These are solid people, good human beings. They want to do the right thing. Their instincts are good. How much can they reasonably achieve within the framework of the status quo system? And I think people are wrong if they think, oh, well, if we elect him, he'll save us. What's he going to do about Congress? Congress doesn't want us to be saved. Congress is very happy with the conditions it enjoys right now. That's our problem. And it's not just Congress. Look at the judicial system. Look at the courts. You know, what? who in their right mind would have ever thought that the judge appointed to decide the case on Donald Trump would be someone who has a long track record of commitment to Marxism and revolutionary uh, socialism. But that's what you've got. You've got people that utterly hate everything that is American. They litter the judiciary. Many of them showed up under Obama, but there were already some there. This has been building for a long time. So we've got serious problems within the framework of government. I don't know how you solve it quickly. So whoever is elected, God bless them, because they are sailing this ship of state into the biggest storm it has faced in its history, certainly since World War II, and some would argue since the Civil War. Yeah. Well, I know uh, you and others are trying to improve the country one day at a time. Uh, you've got a new organization out the website is ourcountryourchoice.com. I'll make sure to leave a link down below. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? And then we'll wrap up. Well, this is an organization that costs nothing to join. That's important for people to know. Uh, and our long-term plan is to have representatives all over the country working with other organizations that are like-minded, organizations that believe as we do, first and foremost, in God, country, and family. That's effectively our motto. We want to focus like a laser on the really big issues that need to be solved to save this country. And we hope that lots of people will join us. We've been very, very pleased with the overwhelming response. And keep in mind, this is a platform that other organizations can join, that they can use. Our plan is to make this platform usable for other like-minded organizations. We are not associated with the Democrat or Republican parties. We have nothing to do with the RNC and the DNC. This is a purely American operation. We are all Americans first. We want to solve these problems as Americans for Americans. So anybody out there that's listening to this, please go to that website, look it over, and if you're comfortable, join it. And eventually we do pay plan to pay people to work on the ground in our various congressional districts and states for the right candidates. And what I mean by that is 
We want people to know what these people we vote for actually stand for. Because in many cases, I don't know how often I run into it, you, you, we elect someone from a particular district and the man's a nightmare, or the woman is. Whatever we elected them to do, they have no intention of doing. A good example of that is Bob Good, that ultimately won here in the western end of uh, Northern Virginia and Southern Virginia in a very large congressional district. But we had to rid ourselves of the previous incumbent Republican who uh, behaved like a Hillary Clinton disciple ran on one platform and did something else. We've got to stop this sort of thing. So to that extent, we're going to try and provide people with the truth. And again, Democrats who agree with us, who believe in God, country, and family are welcome. We want them. You know, this business of, well, you know, the Democrats, no. The Democratic Party has long since left most of its constituents, just as the Republican Party has. Between us, we can win if we unite. And I think it's possible. Right. Thank you very much, Colonel McGregor, for spending time with us today. And I will make sure to put that website down below. Thank you again for coming on.